Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, uh, everybody. A very warm welcome, wherever you are, to uh, this uh, uh, webinar brought to you by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, it is actually uh, 6 p.m. in Paris, 5 p.m. in London, uh, noon in New York and New Haven, but also 9.30 p.m. in Chennai in India. And our topic for today is uh, uh, clonal hematopoiesis origins and clinical implications. I'm sure uh, you are well aware that this is really a very hot topic. I mean, when uh, I was at medical school, we never heard about this, but now more and more, I think, in the field of cancer, uh, we can, thanks to the uh, advances of uh, molecular biology and uh, uh, genome sequencing, we are able to detect very early some of these uh, abnormalities, but also preconditions. And probably it's going and it is providing a lot of hope to detect, to anticipate, to screen, and probably at some point uh, prevent, but also cure many uh, terrible diseases. So very hot topic, very exciting topic. And uh, we're very glad having uh, uh, Dr. Lourdes Mendez uh, to give this uh, webinar. She is an MD, PhD, top expert in this field. She completed her residency at Whale Cornell New York. Uh, and she did her fellowship in hematology oncology at uh, BIDMC, uh, but also, uh, and this is probably uh, the reason for her interest in this topic, uh, she did her postdoctoral uh, fellowship in cancer uh, genetics. Uh, she was instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School uh, and the leukemia program leader there. Uh, she is uh, currently uh, much focused on the management of patients with mild uh, malignancies and disorders in general. And very recently, and she will tell us, I think, about this, uh, she uh, has uh, uh, created, established, and is currently running a specific a clinic uh, dedicated to precision uh, medicine in order uh, to see and uh, manage uh, these patients with precursor conditions. So, uh, Dr. Mendez, thank you really for joining us. We're very honored and pleased having uh, such a top expert to uh, enlighten us and the uh, contributors, members of the ICH about this topic. Uh, the floor is yours, and this is an interactive uh, webinar. So please do not hesitate to post your questions. Please send your comments, suggestions, and we'll have uh, a Q&A uh, session immediately after uh, the talk of Dr. Mendez. I think we'll go for roughly 40, 45 minutes of talk, and then we'll reconvene for another uh, 10 minutes of discussion. So Lourdes, the uh, floor is yours. So it's a pleasure to be um, talking on the topic of clonal hematopoiesis today um, with um, a focus on the clinical implications um, and origin of this condition. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so the talk um, can be divided into three parts. Um, the first part um, is an introduction um, and sets definitions as well as introduces subtypes of clonal hematopoiesis, um, and then goes on to talk about the risk of clonal hematopoiesis evolving to a hematologic neoplasm. Part two um, focuses on the risk of um, non-hematologic diseases that's associated with clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and part three um, focuses on what we know about the natural history um, about uh, regarding CHIP, um, particularly as regards um, the context of aging. So clonal hematopoiesis is a form of somatic uh, mosaicism, which refers to the fact that within an organism or a tissue, there are genetically distinct populations of somatic, um, in other words, non-germ cells. 
um, that give rise to heterogeneity, which is represented in this figure um, by the different colors um, of cells. Clonal hematopoiesis specifically refers to the expansion um, of hematopoietic stem cells um, that bear a somatic genetic alteration that provides them with a selective um, advantage. And this advantage is defined by context with age being one context. These genetic alterations can include point mutations in cancer-related genes, small insertions or deletions, um, structural chromosomal alterations that are referred to as mosaic chromosomal alterations, um, some of which are enumerated below. Um, and it can also occur with somatic variants that don't have a described uh, role in cancer. So the existence of hematopoietic somatic mosaicism um, has been known for some time, um, in particular um, as regards the presence of leukemia-associated chromosomal alterations in a subset of healthy individuals um, with the frequency being related to age. However, once the lens of next-generation sequencing technology was turned um, onto large cohorts of healthy individuals, um, the capacity to define the prevalence of clonal hematopoiesis um, and therefore its clinical um, implications became possible, really launching um, what is nothing less than a new chapter um, in the um, history of hematopoiesis, but really also medicine. So there were uh, three to four concurrent high-profile publications, really seminal studies um, that launched the field of clonal hematopoiesis. Um, one by Genovese um, and colleagues um, analyzed whole sequencing, um, sorry, whole exome sequencing data from the blood of over 12,000 um, individuals. And they found that the frequency of clonal hematopoiesis was related to age with 0.9% of persons younger than 50 years old having clonal hematopoiesis, whereas 10.4% of persons older than 65 years of age um, had clonal hematopoiesis. And there, the most frequent recurring cancer-associated mutations were in genes with well-established roles um, in um, hematologic malignancies, but in particular in leukemia. Um, and these were DNMT3A, TET2, ASXL1, and PPM1D um, in this study. Um, as one might imagine, um, clonal hematopoiesis was associated with a greater than tenfold increased risk of the subsequent development of a uh, hematologic cancer. Um, and importantly, there was also a reduced overall survival um, that was observed um, in individuals with clonal hematopoiesis. And the reduced overall survival was not related to deaths from hematologic cancers, but rather other cancers. Um, and in this cohort, an association between clonal hematopoiesis and smoking. Um, in a second back-to-back -back publication in the New England Journal in 2014, Jaiswal and colleagues um, analyzed uh, whole exome sequencing data from over 17,000 um, individuals um, from 22 cohorts in type 2 diabetes um, association studies. And again, uh, found that there was, um, in the presence of clonal hematopoiesis, an increased risk of hematologic cancer. And moreover, uh, the individuals who went on to develop hematologic cancer versus those who did not um, possessed an increased variant allele frequency um, of the cancer-related mutation. As with the previ previous study, um, there was also an increased all-cause mortality. In this study, the mortality was second to um, cardiovascular disease and not to cancer, um, which was a uh, surprising um, and significant finding. Um, and in fact, the hazard ratio for inc incident coronary um, heart disease and, and ischemic stroke um, were both increased um, in a way um, that was also correlated with the variant allele frequency of the mutation. In a third study published um, uh, really concurrently, um, the sequencing data from over 2,000 individuals um, from the Cancer Genome Atlas um, 
was analyzed. And again, a positive correlation was found um, between blood specific as opposed to tumor specific mutations in leukemia and lymphoma genes and age. Um, and in this particular study, um, the frequency of these mutations um, as found in the TCGA cohort was compared with the frequency um, as observed in other um, cohorts um, representing different types of leukemia and myeloid neoplasms, mainly MDS, MPN, CLL, and AML, um, as shown here. And on the x-axis, we see different recurrently um, mutated genes um, implicated in um, cancer and in um, myeloid neoplasms. And the different cohorts um, are color-coded. Um, and you can see that um, the TCGA blood samples, um, so those individuals without um, a hematologic neoplasm, kind of are, are clustering on this end of the graph, um, whereas there's a different set of genes um, that are enriched um, sometimes exclusively in those patients for the sake of simplicity with acute myeloid leukemia, um, thus suggesting a distinction between um, genes um, and gene mutations that are initiating events um, and common to um, all or most of the diseases and those that are specific um, for AML um, and are more, more likely to be um, representing uh, mutations that herald progression um, or that um, result in de novo disease. And so now it's been almost 10 years since these uh, seminal publications, and there's um, really a significant amount of literature that's accumulated um, in this uh, nascent field, sufficient enough um, that um, clonal hematopoiesis subtypes are now incorporated into um, the newest iteration of our classification systems for um, hematologic malignancies as published um, in the fall of 2002. So MDS precursor conditions include CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, which is uh, defined um, by um, the finding of a somatic mutation in a cancer-related gene at a variant allele frequency of at least 2% in the absence of a diagnosis of a hematologic malignancy, um, and also in the absence of an unexplained low blood count. And clonal, clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance um, is similar to CHIP, um, but for the presence of a cytopenia um, that is unexplained um, and together um, the diagnostic criteria for a hematologic malignancy um, can still not have been met. There are also precursor conditions um, within clonal hematopoiesis for CMML, um, including clonal monocytosis of undetermined significance and clonal cytopenia and monocytosis of undetermined significance. Clonal hematopoiesis can also be uh, subdivided um, into myeloid type and lymphoid type. Um, as previously noted in the seminal studies, um, when divided into myeloid and lymphoid subtypes, um, CHIP, um, the prevalence of CHIP increases um, for both subtypes with age. And the, the classifier of myeloid versus lymphoid refers to whether the mutation is found in myeloid or lymphoid malignancies, not the lineage um, that's affected by the mutation. Um, and this designation applies to clonal hematopoiesis um, that's characterized by a recurrent um, um, mutation in a cancer-related gene, or clonal hematopoiesis that's characterized by a mosaic chromosomal um, alteration. In myeloid chip, um, the mutational spectrum is dominated by mutations in DNMT3A, TET2, and ASXL1. Whereas in lymphoid chips, the mutations are more evenly spread out amongst uh, many genes, with a few of the most frequent being listed. And um, the uh, designation of myeloid and lymphoid, um, of course, um, is made relevant by um, data showing that the cumulative incidence of myeloid um, or lymphoid malignancies tracks with each subtype 
um, of clonal hematopoiesis. So shown here, um, a myeloid chip is associated with a sevenfold increased risk of myeloid malignancy, whereas um, lymphoid um, or likewise lymphoid chip, chip is associated um, with um, an increased risk of uh, lymphoid malignancy. Um, and the um, and the risk is more pronounced um, when one um, talks about each subtype of um, uh, chip, pardon, clona, um, clonal hematopoiesis characterized by a mosaic um, chromosomal abnormality shown here on the left, a 28.9 fold increased risk of myeloid malignancy um, in clonal hematopoiesis bearing um, a mosaic chromosomal alteration. And yet, uh, despite these increased risks of myeloid and lymphoid malignancies, most cases of clonal hematopoiesis actually do not progress to clinical disease. And the absolute annual risk um, of developing such a disease is very low on the order of 0.5 to 1% um, if all clonal hematopoiesis um, is taken together as a whole. Um, and so this poses a challenge um, for a hematologist seeing an individual who's been identified to have clonal hematopoiesis in terms of um, trying to understand what the future risk is um, of developing um, a future hematologic neoplasm. Um, but importantly, um, there are other potential outcomes of interest um, that a hematologist um, should be aware of. Um, which we'll touch on today. Um, and these include treatment outcomes as well as the risk of chronic diseases, um, importantly, um, that of cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's worth noting um, that the way that these referrals um, come to the hematologist um, is often with the incidental finding of clonal hematopoiesis as um, uh, a product of a solid tumor testing. Um, as a part of an evaluation for uh, a hereditary predisposition to cancer um, as an incidental finding um, as a part of um, cell-free DNA testing from the peripheral blood. Um, although certainly um, the clonal hematopoiesis is detected um, increasingly um, as a part of the evaluation um, for patients who are referred um, and have unexplained cytopenias. So how do we um, currently understand the risk um, associated with clonal hematopoiesis in terms of the future development of um, a myeloid neoplasm? Um, a publication in 2021 by um, Gali and colleagues reported that clone metrics allow risk assessment of um, CCUS in particular. Um, with a variant allele frequency of um, greater than or equal to 10% associated with an increased risk of progression, um, with two or more gene mutations likewise associated with an increased risk. Um, and importantly, um, in the case of two or more gene mutations, specific co-mutation patterns um, uh, were associated or were predictive of pre-malignant condition over um, a myeloid neoplasm. So for example, a single mutation in DNMT3A, TET2, um, or um, ASXL1, or a co-mutation um, amongst um, two of these genes was, is associated with a uh, low risk pre-malignant condition um, as compared to um, a co-mutation pattern um, that uh, includes uh, mutation in a spike sync factor or TP53, um, with certain co-mutation patterns um, having outcomes that were indistinguishable um, from that of a diagnosed myeloid neoplasm. Um, in an attempt to integrate these variables as well as others, um, Dr. Lakel Weeks and colleagues um, recently uh, reported on the clonal hematopoiesis risk score, uh, which we will touch on in a couple of slides. In addition, it's, it's worth noting um, that it's also um, known that there is synergism between gene mutations and um, the mosaic chromosomal alterations that we've been speaking about. Um, and in fact, 63% um, of cases um, with mosaic chromosomal um, alterations will co-occur with at least one gene mutation. Um, and this is correlated um, with high mutation burden um, as well as um, high variant allele frequency. 
And notably, these composite clonal hematopoiesis genotypes have a higher risk of progression to leukemia, 14% um, versus 1% um, in, the, in the study that's noted below. Um, but mosaic chromosomal alterations are not currently uh, routinely tested as part of clinical care. Um, and so this is um, um, arguably an area um, of need um, for the future um, in terms of um, complete risk assessment of someone who has, who's detected to have um, clonal hematopoiesis. So we know um, from studies that have been done um, in the last years that, as I mentioned um, in the previous slide, not all um, gene mutations are equal. Um, some of them um, portend a much higher risk, um, and some of them are in fact associated um, with very uh, benign um, biology. Um, and uh, genetic mutations and splicing um, genes um, are amongst the fastest growing um, clones and are associated with a higher AML risk. Um, and as I mentioned, in an attempt to incorporate such um, information, as well as the contribution, um, or rather integrate um, the um, various prognostic variables into the risk assessment um, for one um, individual, um, Dr. Weeks and colleagues developed this um, clonal hematopoiesis risk score, which incorporates many of the things we had um, discussed um, that were observed in the publication by Gali and colleagues, um, such as the number of mutations, um, the variant allele fraction, um, but also um, variables that we have yet to discuss, um, such as the red cell distribution width and the MCV, um, as well as whether or not um, the case is one that pertains to CHIP or CCUS, the age, um, and finally, whether there is a single DNMT 3A mutation, um, which is um, a very, very low risk situation, um, as opposed to whether this is a case with a high risk mutation, um, which um, is defined as a mutation involving any one of the genes um, listed in this box. And once all those variables for a given individual have been inputted, the um, output um, looks something like this um, and gives a five-year cumulative risk of myeloid malignancy, a 10-year cumulative risk um, as, where, as well as a prediction for overall survival, which is exactly what um, a person in our clinic um, and you know, the provider seek to understand. But it's very important to note um, that this um, risk um, scoring system is, um, as noted in the disclaimers, um, still a research tool um, that has yet to be prospectively validated. Um, and thus, um, it has to be interpreted um, with caution. So moving on to the second part of the talk, uh, what about clonal hematopoiesis and um, additional clinical applica um, applications or rather implications? So this figure seeks to um, summarize um, many of the um, clinical implications of clonal hematopoiesis other than those related to the development of hematologic cancers. Um, and so there are many deleterious effects um, that have now been documented um, related to the increased risk of um, uh, disease that we have uh, started to talk about, um, such as the increased risk of stroke, um, coronary artery disease, um, but additional heart disease that we'll touch upon um, later, um, but also increased risk of many um, additional chronic diseases um, that are age-related, such as um, that of COPD, not listed here, chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis, gout, um, and importantly, um, as we mentioned um, early in the talk, clonal hematopoiesis is associated with an increased all-cause mortality um, that appears to be related um, to cardiovascular disease. In addition to the deleterious effects, however, there are, uh, there are documented potential beneficial effects um, from clonal hematopoiesis um, 
some of which are listed here um, and which we will talk about um, in ensuing slides. So what could be the possible explanation for clonal hematopoiesis being linked to so many um, chronic diseases, particularly of aging? Well, it's um, several preclinical studies have shown that uh, the mutations um, in uh, hematopoietic stem cells um, lead to innate um, effector cells that produce increased amounts of inflammatory mediators like IL-6 and IL-1. Um, and thus, um, it's currently thought that inflammation is an explanation um, for, um, or at least a partial explanation for the uh, pleiotropic effects that have been um, observed um, and the pleiotropic risks that have been observed um, related to clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and there appears to be a feed forward um, situation in which um, the mutated hematopoietic stem progenitor cells benefit from the increased um, uh, inflammatory milieu um, because they have a selective advantage in such a context of inflammation. Um, and a, a recent study um, has in, in, um, also in a preclinical murine model of TET2 um, chip has recently provided proof um, of concept um, that targeting one um, of these inflammatory pathways, the IL-1 beta pathway, um, is a valid therapeutic target to prevent clonal um, expansion. So most of the research um, has centered really on um, the increased risk of um, cardiovascular disease posed by CHIP um, as regards um, chronic diseases um, as an implication uh, of um, clonal hematopoiesis. So there's a well-documented increased risk of atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease, particularly when variant allele frequencies um, reach or exceed 10%. Um, and amongst the most common um, cancer-related genes that are mutated um, in CHIP, um, JAK2V617F CHIP has um, the highest, um, represents the highest risk of coronary artery disease with a tenfold, uh, sorry, 12-fold increased risk um, of coronary artery disease. Um, and this is compared to the 1.7 to two-fold increased risk um, uh, posed by mutations um, in DNMT3A, ASXL1, and TET2. Um, in addition, um, CHIP is, in, is associated with an increased risk of uh, heart failure, as well as with worse outcomes in the context of heart failure, um, which includes um, uh, progression of heart failure, um, uh, hospitalization and reduced survival in this um, in this context. And preclinical studies um, provide a model of hematopoietic somatic mosaicism of the innate um, immune system um, as driving um, inflammation and therefore coronary artery disease. So um, which is um, what this figure seeks to depict um, for TET2 um, chip. Um, which in a preclinical model um, was recapitulated using TET2 deficient hematopoietic stem cells um, and is um, shown to lead to um, e an increase in atherosclerotic disease um, at, in part through um, increased IL-1 beta, which um, is therefore um, a potential target um, for intervening um, on this process using anti-IL-1 beta antibodies. And in fact, um, the Canto study of canakinumab, um, an IL-1 beta blocking antibody, um, provided um, proof of concept that such anti-inflammatory um, anti therapy um, could be um, active um, in a subset of patients with coronary artery disease. So, now moving on to clonal hematopoiesis um, and the relationship to outcomes in oncology. Clonal hematopoiesis is common in patients with cancer. Um, 
multiple studies, some of which are listed here, documenting association with outcomes in patients that have solid tumors, myeloma, lymphoma, um, and suggest that there is a relationship between malignant cells and the pre-malignant clonal cells um, of CHIP. And it may be that malignant cells drive immune dysfunction and thus allow the expansion of clonal hematopoietic stem cells, or that clonal hematopoietic stem cells promote disease progression in part through pro-inflammatory cytokine production or some combination of these. CHIP is uh, quite common um, in patients with lymphoma who are undergoing autologous stem cell transplant uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, as well as in patients with multiple myeloma um, who are undergoing autologous stem cell transplantation um, as detected prior to transplantation um, with the frequencies listed, um, and importantly um, is associated with um, inferior outcomes um, in patients, in those patients who do have CHIP um, related to inferior 10-year um, survival rates. However, um, in, a, in the setting of allogeneic stem cell transplantation, um, clonal hematopoiesis may at times um, tell be one um, of a, a more positive um, story. So there was a study on the effect of clonal hematopoiesis in nearly 2,000 donors who were 40 years of age and older. Um, and in this study, DNMT3A donor-derived clonal hematopoiesis was associated with improved overall survival, um, as well as decreased relapse risk um, and an elevated risk of chronic GVHD um, within uh, patients um, with a specific GVHD uh, protocol. Um, and uh, by, con by contrast, um, there was very rare incidence of donor-derived um, leukemia over 10 years that um, appeared to be specific um, to, um, to high-risk genes, um, mainly TP53 or splicing factor um, uh, mutations. Um, and thus, um, it may be that, um, as highlighted, by this slide and the prior slides, the, um, the context um, of the, um, in which clonal hematopoiesis is occurring is um, essential to understanding and um, outcomes. So in um, other cellular therapies um, and, and outcomes uh, related to clonal hematopoiesis, um, there's also been observed to be um, a high frequency of clonal hematopoiesis. Um, such as in, in patients um, receiving CAR-T therapy um, and uh, arguably consistent with the um, pro-inflammatory um, biology that's been described for um, clonal hematopoiesis um, uh, immune effector cells. There's an increased risk of ICANS and CRS that's been observed. Um, but interestingly, there's no effect on survival um, rates with a, or without clonal hematopoiesis. There was um, a very um, a much discussed um, high profile publication in which the, dis the disruption of TET2 in CAR T cells was reported to promote therapeutic efficacy. Um, and this um, brings up the important point that um, it may be that we can harness um, the mutations that are present um, in clonal hematopoiesis or in CHIP um, or um, harness insights about the biology um, that is um, downstream of CHIP um, for the benefit um, of our, our patients um, when they undergo treatment um, for cancer. Now turning to the third part of the talk um, on clonal hematopoiesis origins and evolution. So the current um, model of how clonal hematopoiesis arises focuses um, heavily on the development of um, mutations in hematopoietic stem cells um, over time. Um, but there's also increasing information on the um, contribution of germline predisposition loci um, 
to the risk of developing clonal hematopoiesis. Little is known about environmental exposures um, that promote clonal hematopoiesis, um, but there's um, quite a bit uh, more that's known about and um, reported about um, context specific um, clonal hematopoiesis because the genetic repertoire um, of clonal hematopoiesis varies depending on the context. For example, um, there are specific uh, mutations that are recurrently observed um, in the context of um, treatment with um, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, um, such as in TP53 um, and PPM1D. Um, there's and, and there's also um, additional contexts such as um, autoimmunity um, and bone marrow failure syndromes that have re revealed um, specific um, uh, repertoires of genes um, associated with clonal hematopoiesis um, in, in the giving in the given setting. Um, and what remains to be seen is whether um, there are specific epigenomic contexts. Um, that influence um, uh, clonal hematopoiesis arising, um, or whether there are age-associated alterations in the microenvironment that really um, make it more likely for this to occur, um, as well as whether there are age-associated alterations in immune surveillance um, that are related to the origins of, um, or the frequency of clonal hematopoiesis, particularly with age. So uh, let's spend a moment talking about um, hematopoietic stem cell mutations um, over time. So an individual is born with 50,000 to um, 200,000 hematopoietic stem cells um, that have the role of um, regenerating blood throughout um, the person's lifetime. And the hematopoietic stem cell or a given hematopoietic stem cell is estimated to divide monthly or approximately 10 to the 16th times um, over a lifetime. And that is a lot of opportunities um, for a, um, a mutation um, to go wrong in the process of um, DNA replication or repair. It's estimated that about one protein coding mutation occurs every 10 years per hematopoietic stem cell, such that by age 70, an individual's hematopoietic stem cell pool has um, an astonishing um, number of protein coding mutations. Um, and if one of these um, happens to confer a competitive advantage, such as increased self-renewal or increased proliferation, this leads to clonal outgrowth um, and clonal hematopoiesis that can then be detected um, in the clinic or in the lab. So in addition to um, this um, constant mutational risk, um, there's also an increasing body of knowledge on the germline predisposition to clonal hematopoiesis. Um, in, in one such study by Carr and colleagues, there was a genome-wide association um, study of over 200,000 individuals, um, UK biobank participants. Uh, participants, um, and the objective was to map the landscape of the inherited predisposition to clonal hematopoiesis. And importantly, um, new loci were identified, um, and the genes at those loci implicated um, DNA damage repair, um, hematopoietic stem cell migration and homing, and myeloid oncogenesis um, as processes um, that are um, related to the germline predisposition to clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and just, link, uh, just listing these, um, for the first in particular, DNA damage repair, one can easily imagine um, how that might um, combine um, for a very high risk um, situation um, in the setting of um, cytotoxic therapy um, for a malignancy. Causal risk factors um, confirmed or identified um, by this study um, included smoking and longer leukocyte telomere length. Um, longer leukocyte telomere length is starred um, to bring, uh, to call attention to um, a recent um, publication uh, further uh, substantiating and elaborating um, on this um, uh, risk factor for clonal hematopoiesis. 
Um, and finally, genetic uh, predisposition to clonal hematopoiesis was associated with an increased risk for myeloproliferative neoplasms, non-hematologic cancer, um, atrial fibrillation, um, and blood epigenetic aging. Um, so again, um, speaking to the pleiotropic effects and risks um, that are potentially represented by clonal hematopoiesis um, that... Uh, extend far beyond that of the development of a hematologic neoplasm. So what do we know about the natural history of clonal hematopoiesis once it arises? Um, we know that advancing age affects um, driver genes that, um, in a gene-specific manner. For example, DNMT3A mutations show no specific relationship with age, whereas TET2 mutations and splicing factor mutations show a consistent increase with age. Um, and interestingly, some clones such as DNMT3A and uh, TP53 mutated clones actually decelerate with age, um, whereas this is less likely to unlikely with TET2 mutated clones and fast growing clones. So uh, phylogenetic trees, um, which is the name of um, the, the data representation that we're seeing here, um, have been used to represent um, the hematopoietic stem cell pool um, over time. The um, y-axis is a representation of time. Um, and uh, um, across, we have a representation of um, individual hematopoietic stem cell clones. Um, and this is um, an example of the um, hematopoietic um, uh, stem cell pool um, in a patient who's in their 20s. And by contrast, um, this is a representation of the hematopoietic stem cell pool um, in um, an individual that's close to 70 years of age. And what you can see um, is that there's a significant dropout um, of hematopoietic stem cell uh, clones. And so um, this is an oligoclonal situation, um, whereas in the young person, um, there is polyclonal hematopoiesis. And this is observed to be a major feature um, and change in the aging hematopoietic system. What about the age of onset of clonal hematopoiesis? Um, most drivers initiate expansion um, of the clone throughout life. And remarkably, the average latency between the clone arising um, and becoming detectable at a variant allele, a frequency of 2% or more is 30 years. Uh, specific um, mutations um, display varying um, uh, rates of clonal growth. And so the slowest growing clones are DNMT3A and TP53 at 5% per year um, in this study. Um, whereas um, those with an intermediate growth rate are um, mutations in TET2, ASXL1, PPM1D, um, and um, clones bearing a mutation in SRSF2, U2AF1, and PTPN11 um, um, grew at 15 to 20% per year. And you may recall um, that we um, discussed that um, the, the growth rate, a fast growth rate is associated um, with an increased risk um, of AML. So what do we know about clonal evolution um, once um, clonal hematopoiesis has arisen? Um, so a recent study um, published this year um, uh, analyzed longitudinal sequencing data from participants that were greater than or equal to 60 years of age from the Lifelines um, cohort, which is made up um, of individuals um, from the Netherlands, um, to characterize the evolution of clonal hematopoiesis um, with a particular focus on participants with blood count abnormalities, whether that be cytopenias or um, cytoses, elevated blood counts. Um, and interestingly, uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia were associated with um, clonal hematopoiesis, but not um, the other um, cytopenias or cytoses. Over 3.6 years, um, notably, there were losses of certain clones, but there were also um, gains, often in spliceosome and TP53 um, uh, bearing clones, or mutant clones. 
Um, and again, um, mutations in spliceosome, JAK2, TP53K, and RAS um, confer the highest risk for myeloid cancer. And yet most participants did not develop a myeloid malignancy, even um, when both clonal hematopoiesis and cytopenias or cytoses um, were present. And so with all the information um, that we've reviewed um, thus far, um, it really um, speaks to um, an overlap in the origin between aging and cancer, which um, 10 years ago was put forth um, as related to the accumulation of cellular damage. But based on insights from the study of clonal hematopoiesis may also be related to the ensuing loss of diversity and thus functionality and the plasticity of an aging hematopoietic and immune system. So what are evolving implications of the detection of clonal hematopoiesis? Um, we can expect that our diagnostic algorithms will continue to be refined as we learn more about um, clonal hematopoiesis, particularly um, high-risk forms with biology that's similar to myeloid neoplasms. Um, clonal hematopoiesis, um, the detection of uh, different types of clonal hematopoiesis are expected to um, ultimately inform our surveillance for the development of or persistence of myeloid neoplasms, although this certainly um, is not incorporated into clinical care yet. Um, and conceivably, um, as suggested by um, the Canto study, certain types of clonal hematopoiesis may serve as a biomarker for response to anti-inflammatory therapy for cardiovascular disease but potentially for other chronic diseases as well. There are ongoing clinical trials um, for high-risk forms of clonal hematopoiesis, um, specifically for CCUS, um, some of which are listed um, and are an exciting initial um, foray into the space of um, intervening on the natural history of high-risk clonal hematopoiesis um, it, with the promise to uh, perhaps um, delay or prevent um, a frank myeloid neoplasm. And clonal hematopoiesis um, is now being incorporated um, as a part of correlative studies in a variety of clinical trials um, in multiple spaces. Um, and ongoing studies on integrated um, genetic profiling um, as, uh, as it informs um, risk assessment for subsequent development of um, a hematologic neoplasm, but also chronic diseases um, will hopefully lay the groundwork um, for such um, profiling um, in the clinic um, in the future. In summary, clonal hematopoiesis um, is an incredibly um, exciting and dynamic um, part of um, hematology, but really um, medicine that uh, has, is, has nothing short of revolutionized um, the way we think about the risk for um, hematologic neoplasms, but also chronic diseases. Um, and it seems that clonal hematopoiesis um, and, um, and both hematologic and non-hematologic um, potential complications are linked, at least in part, um, by uh, pro-inflammatory um, signaling um, that is um, upregulated in mutated immune effector cells, um, and in particular innate immune effector cells. Um, and the interaction of pre-malignant um, hematopoietic clones with malignant clones or non-hematopoietic aging tissues um, and the effect on outcomes is a nascent field of research um, that is expected to uh, provide um, you know, unprecedented insights as well as lay the groundwork um, for um, novel interventions um, in hematology and beyond hematology. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, my colleagues in um, uh, the myeloid and uh, leukemia disease group um, and beyond. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.
very much, uh, Dr. Mendez, for really a uh, beautiful talk. And actually, we had a lot of uh, uh, congratulation messages uh, for such a beautiful and comprehensive talk. Uh, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of questions. And I know we started already replying to some of them in writing and people were quite happy. So I'll, I'll do my best to try to put together uh, because some questions uh, are overlapping in different topics. So uh, one question is about the uh, whether there is an ethnic uh, dominance, whether there are variations when it comes to ship between, because we have questions about the Japanese, about uh, Asian, about black, etc. Is there any uh, special issues related to this or this ethnicity when it comes to ship? Um, I believe that there are um, uh, specific patterns of clonal hematopoiesis that are specific to ethnicities. Um, and so, and this has been noted, um, the importance of, um, you know, having diverse biobanks, because many of the biobanks that are fundamental to the research that's been published so far, um, perhaps they don't all capture the diversity of you know ethnicities in the way that they they might um and this is probably going to be very important to the hereditary um component of clonal hematopoiesis which is rapidly um being described so really the lion's share of what's known right now is um specific to um kind of a caucasian european um population um and so we look forward to information um, that's a little bit broader. Excellent, thank you very much. When it comes to the pathophysiology, uh, are is there any role for inflammation, but also autoinflammatory diseases beside age in the uh, pathogenesis of uh, these complications? Yes, so an increased um, frequency of uh, clonal hematopoiesis has been described in um, many different types of um, autoimmune diseases. Um, and I, I think the question um, more broadly gets at the question of in what context can clonal hematopoiesis arise? Um, and that gets to the theme of the fact that clonal hematopoiesis is actually very much defined by its environment and the selection pressure um, of that specific environment. Um, and so there are many publications that have shown this by studying specific situations like bone marrow failure syndromes or one specific situation. Um, and depending on um, the genetic defect, um, there are clonal different um, subtypes of clonal hematopoiesis um, arise sometimes to relieve the stress that's imposed on that, you know, failing bone marrow. Um, unfortunately, um, sometimes it's by inactivating TP53, which can um, then be a, a road to the development of a myeloid neoplasm. Um, and there was a question about aplastic anemia and whether clonal hematopoiesis can arise um, and, and is an explanation for why some people subsequently develop a myeloid neoplasm. Um, and, and this is a whole line of, um, of research um, led by, in large part, by the NIH. Um, and there are interestingly specific um, patterns of clonal hematopoiesis that arise in people who are younger that have aplastic anemia that seem to be related to the immune system, um, whereas clonal hematopoiesis that arises in older individuals with aplastic anemia seems to be more characterized by age-associated um, mutations. Um, so, but yes, the context of inflammation, um, someone asked about inflammatory bowel disease, um, does seem to be associated with a higher frequency of clonal hematopoiesis. Excellent. So one question is about screening and testing. Would you consider uh, searching or testing for SHIP uh, associated mutation in an individual that do not does not present with any cytopenia or other symptoms? So 
The answer is no, that we don't screen for clonal hematopoiesis. Um, if it's a recurrent genetic mutation, it's CHIP. So we don't screen for CHIP. Um, we don't screen for clonal hematopoiesis that has a chromosomal alteration that's even harder to do. Um, but perhaps the space where this may come first um, is another form of context-dependent clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and it is in individuals who are either going to face um, cytotoxic chemotherapy or radiation therapy or have already been treated with um, chemotherapy or radiation therapy. There is still no, um, th there's still insufficient evidence to support screening um, such individuals, but there, as kind of came up during the talk, as a byproduct of other um, genetic testing, this is incidentally discovered. And this is probably one of the groups of greatest need in terms of understanding who and when um, to screen. Um, but right now we do not screen. So we have a recurrent question and we face this in uh, daily practice when it comes to family members uh, who are donating uh, their bone marrow for a sibling, you know, a haploidentical donor of mad sibling donor. So here, I mean, the donor in theory is totally asymptomatic and uh, you have no uh, clinical signs, uh, but still uh, uh, this person is donating uh, to a close member who has a malignancy. So how would you handle uh, this? Are there any recommendations in this field? Um, so how to, how to handle and when to consider screening, um, a family member who's like a related donor, um, for transplant really right now starts with the recipient and whether there's any, um, any information, any data that suggests that the person who needs a transplant and who has the malignancy um, like there could be an inherited component um, to their myeloid or, or what, you know, hematologic malignancy. And there are specific criteria laid out for that. For example, in the um, 2022 ELN AML guidelines. Um, and so if, if there's some suspicion that, um, that the recipient may have some kind of germline predisposition, then that does form an imperative um, for, um, for checking the donor, but there is no, there is no screening of donors right now, um, to look for clonal hematopoiesis. Um, there, it seems that there's accumulating data, um, in, in this space, um, that to my knowledge is not published yet that, um, may change the way we do things. Um, but to my knowledge, um, our practice hasn't changed yet. Excellent. So here we have uh, another question about uh, uh, ship detection, and are you aware whether ship mutations have already been detected uh, in utero and in children? Um, so, yes, the answer is yes. Um, and um, in the talk, when I was talking about when these variants arise, I mentioned um, that on average, it's the data suggests um, that they have arisen up to 30 years ahead of when we actually can detect them, you know, with our technologies um, as chips, something with a variant allele frequency, we define it as 2% or greater. And we certainly have technologies that can detect um, clones that are smaller in size. Um, and I think the question is, can we now detect that in someone who is expecting a child. I'm not sure if that is perhaps the question. Um, I, I know that I can say that we we know that they are present um, in in some uh, you know developing human beings um, that the the very these mutations occur very, very early, we think post conception. Um, and we're still still learning about why um, that occurs in some people and not in others. Um, and in fact, um, if 
such a, an event occurs, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily always a linear process after that. Um, there's some mutations where um, the growth pattern is does not seem to always be in an increasing fashion. Um, and one of the studies that I referenced, um, as well as others, have even um, reported that variants can disappear, that you know, chip clones can disappear. Um, so the answer is they yes, we we believe that they um, very high profile uh, papers have published that they are they occur very early, including in utero. Excellent, thank you very much. So uh, uh, there is uh, uh, one question here about uh, uh, actually there's a comment from Professor Nagler who is uh, listening to us and saying that. In a recent uh, a blood advance paper, actually the percentage uh, of SHIP in children who are recovering from cancer five years later is extremely high. Any comment on this? Um, I mean, only kind of similar to you know what I was saying before, as we think about what populations um, may be suitable for screening, um, you know. Like this, this is a younger population. There's more years, more DNA divisions to be had. Um, so, you know, this is another, this is a subpopulation of those, you know, treated or who, you know, are um, potentially facing treatment, the pediatric population, but seems like one of the ones that will um, first come up, hopefully with guidelines for who to, to screen and who to prospectively follow. So it's, I mean, um, when we were talking before about the variables, you know, inflammation um, and other stressors that seem to, um, you know, potentially promote clonal hematopoiesis. So um, cytotoxic chemotherapy and radiation therapy um, certainly um, stress the hematopoietic system. Um, and um, there's a particular interest um, in individuals who may have um, pre-existing um, clonal hematopoiesis in genes related to DNA damage, um, like TP53, um, and the fact that it may give an opportunity for such um, clones, which can be very problematic if they find the, their way to becoming myeloid neoplasms. Um, it, this is a specific subject of, um, of research um, probably in the adult, and we'll see um, in the pediatric patients. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take all the remaining questions. It's already four minutes past the hour. Uh, I'm sure, uh, guys, you can reach out to Dr. Mendez by email if there is any specific question would like to ask her. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. This was an incredible success, especially uh, given the uh, summer holidays. And I thought uh, uh, the webinar would be poorly attended, but this is actually amazing. And uh, it reflects the uh, top quality of our expert today, Dr. Mendez, but also the importance of uh, this topic in the field of uh, cancer and hematology uh, in general, but also beyond, we know, cardiovascular, IBD, et cetera. So thank you all very much for uh, following the ICH activities, for being loyal to the ICH. Actually, this webinar was quite special because like every year, we will have our uh, actually uh, uh, summer uh, break. Uh, our summer break uh, and we will uh, start again the different webinars and activities early September but actually in August we will continue having our weekly podcast so something very easy to follow you can enjoy it during your vacation very quick and small podcast so wherever you are I wish you a lovely summer a uh, lovely time, some nice vacations, holidays, if uh, you're taking some soon, or I hope you enjoyed your vacations if it's already done. So wherever you are, please 
uh, enjoy the uh, holidays and please stay safe and keep well. Thank you so much.